I want you to hit me as hard as you can. When Mad Max Fury Road came barreling into theaters in the summer of 2015, it was immediately greeted with praise for its high-octane action, fascinating characters, and jaw-dropping stunts. But the movie had such an arduous journey through production, it's amazing that it even got finished before an actual apocalypse could happen. Let's pour some gasoline into the last of the V8 interceptors and find out what the fuck happened to this movie. George Miller was working as an emergency room physician in Australia during the 1970s, when his interest in cinema found him spending off hours collaborating on short films with a group of like-minded associates. This eventually led to his feature directing debut with the 1979 action thriller Mad Max. Set in a near future, the gritty revenge movie starred a young Mel Gibson as Max Rokotansky, a highway cop chasing down a homicidal biker gang. Filmed guerrilla style for a few hundred thousand dollars, Mad Max generated millions in revenue, and Miller and Gibson zoomed right back to the wasteland for Mad Max 2 The Road Warrior and Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. As the budgets grew, Miller's vision for the harsh post-apocalypse became more ambitious and more outrageous. From the deteriorating but still existent civilization of the first Mad Max, the Road Warrior ventures deep into lawless flatlands, where vicious marauders in unusual outfits terrorize a small settlement to acquire precious oil. The third movie's barren desert leads to the fully functioning community of Bartertown, complete with its own pig-powered fuel source, and a justice system where disputes are settled by strapping into bungee cords and whacking each other with mallets. While the Mad Max series obviously wasn't the first depiction of a cinematic post-apocalypse, the designs of Miller's ravaged hellscape and its various inhabitants helped to define the look of any decimated futuristic setting from that point forward. Dusty planes, muscular madmen, athletic gear armor, scrap-covered vehicles, and scruffy protagonists all became standard ingredients for movies set after the downfall of society. But as video stores and late-night cable channels quickly became filled with countless Mad Max knockoffs, George Miller put the wasteland in his rearview mirror and drove on to other territories. Miller headed to Hollywood for the adaptation of The Witches of Eastwick, only to find himself on more rough road with overbearing producers and the prickly personalities of A-list talent. The bitter experience sent him back to Australia, where he produced several made-for-TV movies and features like Dead Calm and Flirting. He was drawn back to directing for Universal's 1992 medical drama Lorenzo's Oil with Nick Nolte and Susan Sarandon, but then he hit more rocky terrain on his Hollywood career path. In the early 90s, Miller spent nearly a year working with Carl Sagan and Anne Druyan on the sci-fi drama Contact. But conflicts with Warner Brothers over budget, production schedule, and the overall direction of the story led to a parting of ways, and Robert Zemeckis took over the project. Miller more recently stated that his own vision for Contact involved far less exposition and more exploration, picturing it closer in execution to Christopher Nolan's Interstellar. Miller spent much of the 1990s bringing an adorable pig to life, in a pair of Babe movies. But his heart and mind never really left the savage wasteland behind. One benefit of his departure from Contact was that as part of the settlement, Warner Brothers agreed to give him back the rights to the Mad Max movies, and Miller still had plenty of creative fuel left in the tank. The premise he started with was deceptively simple. Miller basically wanted to take the third act pursuit of previous Mad Max movies, but stretch it out to feature length to make one long, sustained, adrenaline frenzy action sequence and tell the entire movie's narrative within that context. The story didn't come together in any traditional sense. British artist Brendan McCarthy had worked in comics and on storyboards for movies like Highlander 2 and the 1990 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. In the mid-90s, he was a designer on the computer animated cartoon Reboot and had made a Road Warrior parody episode called Bad Bob. He sent a copy to George Miller with a note wondering whatever happened to Mad Max. To his surprise, McCarthy was later contacted by Miller's longtime producing partner, Doug Mitchell, and invited to a meeting. One thing led to another, and within months, McCarthy found himself brainstorming with Miller to expand his original concept of breeding wives rescued from a horrific despot by a warrior woman, with Max caught up in the middle. Story beats for this new Mad Max were sketched out visually on a large electro board, which could then be printed. A 100-page pitch document was also assembled with artwork and descriptions to entice the studios. Subtitled Fury Road, even in its early incarnation, the movie didn't have a conventional screenplay, but instead an illustrated first draft of storyboards. 
Miller's inspiration for the original Mad Max movies came from silent film giants Harold Lloyd and Buster Keaton in the kinetic storytelling they could convey silently, and he admired the work of Alfred Hitchcock, who could create a mood without a need for dialogue or subtitles. Other artists like Mark Sexton and vehicle expert Peter Pound were brought in to further flesh out the world of Fury Road, ultimately leading to a complete story of automotive mayhem told through more than 3,500 storyboard images. Nico Lathoris, who played the Grease Rat in the first Mad Max, worked with Miller to fine-tune a script and helped to craft loads of additional backstory. Production designer Colin Gibson had the laborious task of somehow bringing Miller and the design team's madcap ideas into reality. Constructing the practical costumes and vehicles would be challenging enough, but the production also needed a suitable location. Since the lengthy chase would not be performed on asphalt, the right environment was required for driving at high speed. After scouting everywhere from Chile to Tunisia to Bolivia, it was decided that the African country of Namibia would serve the purpose. In 2002, Mad Max Fury Road was officially announced. Mel Gibson would star and produce the top secret project through his Icon Productions, collecting a monumental $25 million of the movie's $104 million budget, with Fox planning a 2004 release date for the movie. But in early 2003, a wrench was thrown into the gears. The after-effects of 9-11 were reaching the production. The Iraq War, the US dollar value, insurance problems, the star's increasing hesitation, and the studio's concerns of transplanting a gigantic crew to Africa all combined to put a major roadblock in front of the fourth Mad Max movie. With Fury Road stalled, Miller steered his attention to the animated dancing penguins of Happy Feet, which was a box office hit upon release in 2006. From there, before Marvel's Avengers ever had a chance to assemble, Miller was going to gather the heavy hitters of DC Comics for Justice League Mortal, which would have featured Army Hammer as Batman, and Fury Road's Vuvalini warrior Megan Gale as Wonder Woman. But the costumed epic went to the grave in the wake of a Hollywood writer's strike and the success of 2008's The Dark Knight, which convinced Warner Brothers to focus on solo superhero movies instead. And then once again, Fury Road started to rev its engines. Mel Gibson's unpleasant and very public behavior problems had made him persona non grata in Hollywood, and with two decades between his last appearance as Max, Miller thought he had aged out of the character anyway. By the mid-2000s, the director had already been having regular conversations with Heath Ledger about taking over the role. Intriguingly, Ledger's name had also been associated with the project even in the early days, with online speculation that he would again play Mel Gibson's on-screen son, or possibly the adult version of the Road Warrior's feral kid. Sadly, when Ledger passed away unexpectedly in 2008, Miller still needed someone else to wear the tattered leathers of Max. Jeremy Renner was briefly considered, but Miller was impressed with Tom Hardy's range after seeing him in Nicholas Winding Refn's Bronson in the TV drama Stuart, A Life Backwards. In Hardy, he felt the same intensity and animal magnetism he first saw in Mel Gibson. When Hardy scored the title role in 2009, he had lunch with Gibson to get his blessing. Hardy had not yet received mainstream exposure from Christopher Nolan's Inception and The Dark Knight Rises, which hit theaters around the same time he was in front of cameras, strapped to a modified Chevy Coupe. Despite a different actor behind the wheel of a resurrected Pursuit special, Miller is reluctant to label Fury Road as a prequel, sequel, or reboot, simply stating that he is revisiting the world. In Miller's early story versions of Fury Road, Max's fierce one-armed counterpart was referred to only as Warrior Woman, and later the Praetorian. Gal Gadot was in the running for the role, but Charlize Theron would play the rogue war captain, now named Imperator Furiosa. Deviating from original designs, Theron and Miller agreed that she shave her head for the role, believing it made sense for the practical purposes of a mechanic, and to help blend in with the hairless war boys. Like many villains, Fury Road's Immortan Joe thinks he's the hero of his story, but is also obsessed with fathering a healthy heir to extend his own bloodline. He's willing to distribute the rare resources of his domain, but only in exchange for worship and undying loyalty. For this hulking tyrant, Miller went back to where he began, recruiting Mad Max's toe cutter, Hugh Keyes Byrne, to play a different reprehensible antagonist some three decades after he went under the wheels of a semi. A few elements of the character had changed over the lengthy course of development. The commodity that he originally controlled was potatoes, which Miller altered to the movie's more appropriate Aqua Cola after hearing about modern water wars in India. And the Immortan was initially envisioned as bald, with blue skin from the color of washing detergent that was offered to him as a tribute from the wretched hordes. After seeing dozens of actresses, Miller selected Zoe Kravitz, Riley Keough, Abby Lee Kershaw, Courtney Eaton, and Rosie Huntington-Whiteley to play the warlord's five beautiful breeding wives. 
Nicholas Holt joined the production as the Immortan's terminally ill but extremely enthusiastic zealot, Nux. Oh, what a day! What a lovely day! At the turn of the decade, Fury Road was once again ready to roll. Mad Max was, ironically, back at Warner Brothers. Casting was complete. Stunts had been rehearsed. Over 150 vehicles were built, and roadways were laid out in the Australian outback of Broken Hill, where the previous Mad Max movies were filmed. But the climate itself conspired against George Miller. After a century of drought, the area was hit with unprecedented rainfall, transforming the arid region into a flower garden. The decision was made to delay production and see if Broken Hill would return to the barren earth and salt flats that the movie demanded. But after 18 months, it was still in a blooming state that would not serve Fury Road's necessary post-apocalyptic environment. Ten years after the first attempt to go there, Fury Road was heading to Namibia, but relocating halfway around the world with all the vehicles, including three complete war rigs, along with a massive crew, had a budgetary impact. A compromise to the shooting schedule needed to be made, shrinking from the planned 150 days down to 120. The truncated timeline dictated that the opening and end sequences at the Immortan's Citadel could not be filmed, which would mean that the movie had a chase, but no point of origin or final destination. Miller and producer Doug Mitchell decided to capture all the desert action and figure out later how to handle the crucial missing scenes. Once on location, Miller's remarkable vision started to become reality. One of the guiding principles for design was, even in the wasteland, people make beautiful things, and production designer Colin Gibson did not disappoint. Gibson and his team focused on found objects, refashioning whatever items might survive the apocalypse into wardrobe, weapons, and other tools, crafting intricately detailed vehicles and elaborate costumes. In addition to giving the wasteland's foot soldiers a fearsome image, the multitude of masks also served the practical purpose of allowing the same stuntmen to play many different henchmen. Fun fact, the Doof Warrior's mask is supposed to be made from the skin of his dead mother's face. The original Mad Max leather jacket had been discovered in Miller's company building, covered with dirt and mold, but intact enough to be used as the pattern for Tom Hardy's outfit. That's my jacket. <laughs> sure. Nearly every day of the shoot was a stunt day. Richard Norton, who appeared in dozens of action movies in the 80s and 90s, acted as fight coordinator, as well as the Immortan's prime imperator. Miller's idea for the Polecats had evolved from a newspaper article about an acrobat on a flexible pole to the counterweighted contraptions in the final film, which were all created and performed for real. The cast performed as many of their own stunts as safety would allow. Dozens of vehicles were driven at frightening speed and flipped, jumped, smashed, crashed, and blown to smithereens, all on camera. Even the flagship vehicle of the Immortan fleet was destroyed in a climactic scrap heap. Stunt coordinator and second unit director Guy Norris, who also worked on Road Warrior, theorized that no other film in history had as much practical stunt work as Fury Road. Filming had started in June of 2012, and was still going in December, and everything was not shiny and chrome. The protracted shoot was taking a toll on all involved. The unrelenting operation of vehicles in sand and dust necessitated ongoing repairs and modifications. The primary cast was confined to the cab of the war rig for a significant portion of the shoot, leading to exhaustion and animosity. Some scenes that appeared to be filmed in scorching heat were in fact brutally cold. In addition to the punishing physical demands of the shoot, Nicholas Holt underwent two hours of makeup each day, adding facial scars and intricate body markings that depict an internal combustion engine to illustrate the mechanic's dedication to the machines. Theron described the remote location shooting as painfully isolating. The conflicting styles of Hardy and Theron led to increasing tensions, with Hardy also directing his frustrations at Miller. Both actors have more recently been diplomatic and transparent in interviews, thanks to the benefit of hindsight and the ability to see the phenomenal finished product, but they admit it was incredibly taxing at the time to try and process tiny pieces of the mosaic when the director had the entire final cut playing only in his head. Friction with the studio also increased as the production was in danger of falling behind schedule and over budget, but principal photography finally wrapped after six grueling months. And still the work continued after cameras stopped. To avoid the risk of overloading the viewer with visual information, Miller, along with cinematographer John Seal and editor Margaret Sixel, had strategically placed the action in the center of every shot. That doesn't mean it was easy for the editor. Sixel had several hundred hours of footage to whittle down to a reasonable runtime. During post-production, there had been a regime change at Warner Brothers. An early cut of the movie with just the second act pursuit, which still came in around three hours, impressed the new executives enough that they gave Miller the go-ahead to complete the bookend sequences at the Citadel. 
In late 2013, the cast and crew reconvened in Australia with the relevant equipment. Constructed on a colossal Sydney soundstage was 500 feet of tunnels and the huge turbines used by the treadmill rats to power the lifts. With the additional time and resources, George Miller was able to properly complete his vision. But the studio seemed to believe they would get a cut that ran under 100 minutes, which Miller and Sixel knew was completely unattainable. They also needed to test a PG-13 cut of the movie, but the R-rated version with the more disturbing material always got a better response. At one point, the flame-throwing musical mascot, Doof Warrior, was nearly eliminated after negative test audience reaction, which simply turned out to be due to a repetitive and grating guitar riff that was used in the Temp soundtrack. At long last, the finished Mad Max Fury Road finally plowed into theaters in May of 2015. The critical and audience response was overwhelmingly positive. It was applauded for its exhilarating spectacle, subversive sexual politics, and imaginative dystopian world. Other filmmakers analyzed and worshipped its achievements. Fury Road collected $375 million worldwide at the box office and was nominated for 10 Academy Awards, including Best Director and Picture, and taking well-deserved trophies for editing, sound, and production design. And yet, Fury Road's drama still wasn't over. In 2018, Miller's production company filed a lawsuit against Warner Brothers, claiming they were due a bonus for delivering the film below the agreed budget of $157 million. In return, the studio filed their own suit, alleging, among other things, that the actual budget was $185 million, and that Miller's company was responsible for a portion of that. Against all odds, Miller's production misfortunes have somehow managed to continue. His fantasy romance, 3,000 Years of Longing, with Tilda Swinton and Idris Elba, was to begin filming in early 2020, right when the coronavirus pandemic shut down practically everything around the globe. Despite all his trials and tribulations, George Miller actually seems eager to return to the post-apocalyptic landscape he created. During the development of Fury Road, enough material was created for another Mad Max chapter subtitled The Wasteland, along with another untitled Max story, and a prequel focusing on Furiosa. A decade ago, Miller had actually explored telling her story in an anime companion film, but is now looking at live action. However, we shouldn't expect to see Charlize Theron as her younger self. Miller recently stated that he doesn't believe the digital de-aging process is where it needs to be quite yet, and the director has reportedly considered Anya Taylor-Joy and Killing Eve star Jodie Comer for the movie. Given Miller's history of bad luck, we'll just have to keep our collective fingers crossed that Furiosa's origin eventually makes it to screens. But at least Fury Road was finally completed. After overcoming endless delays and seemingly insurmountable odds, George Miller and everyone involved crafted a modern masterpiece one of the finest examples of action cinema ever made.